we went up to Utah State, and they're an ag school, and they helped us develop our promontory um, recipe. Promontory is the base from which we do, can't see it very well. Promontory is the base from which we do all of our cheeses because our cows are Jersey cows. We get a lot of cream, a lot of uh, protein, and our cheeses, what we like to call, it's more or less an Irish style cheddar. And it's just a nice creamy cheese. And let's go ahead and taste that. Michael, you can chime in as well. You've got cheeses. So our Promontory actually has won more awards for us than any of our other cheeses, but it's the base from which we do all of the cheeses. So. Just a nice, creamy foundation platform from which we build all of our cheeses, except for uh, two cheeses. We do our, our fresh ricotta, we do curds, and we also do a cheese called Beehive Fresh. And it's uh, interesting cheese. Going back to what I said earlier, about what Sid Cook said. He said the most important process step is where you are right then. So when you're cheddaring the cheese or flipping those slabs over, what do you think, Michael? There you go. He's not moaning, but he's smiling. That's good. Um, when you're flipping those slabs over, you're waiting for basically two things to happen. You're waiting for the moisture to come out of the cheese and you're also waiting for the bacteria to eat a bunch more lactose or sugar and make acid. And that acid is paramount in the aging process. But if you don't slow down that acid production, you'll end up having too much and then you, it won't age properly. So the way you slow it down is you mill the cheese curd into slabs into curds. So you can expose a lot of surface area and then you introduce salt. You saw that in the video. By introducing the stop, it, salt, it stops the bacteria from producing more acid, and you get this a nice, perfectly balanced cheese. Our beehive fresh, on the other hand, what we'll do is instead of milling the slab, we dry salt rub on the outside of the slabs, and by so doing, the salt doesn't slow down the bacteria. It takes several days for that salt to wick, wick its way into the cheese, and therefore, we end up with kind of a sour, creamy, acidic, the acid is way too high in this cheese. So it would not age well, but we don't care because we sell it in about three weeks. And it's just got a real tangy, it's amazing on like pizza. And it's just a great cheese. That's called Beehive Fresh. But it illustrates what things happen in the cheese if you don't take every step seriously. What did you just, you just grabbed some, Preserves, what is that? Red pepper jelly. Ooh, that sounds good. And uh, a rosemary 34 degree cracker. Oh, there you go. Because this is, you know, this has, like what you were saying, it's a great platform. You know, this is not a, a high salty, high acid, high you know, sharp cheese. This has got a lot of butter. It has a, a, a nice balance of tang. And I'm not saying that it doesn't have sharpness. It, it has enough that really brings in a very pleasant and easy, uh, you know, e easy to eat like the whole piece. <laughs> it's so nice. But it's that English style, which has got a little bit of that uh, I, I, the best way I would describe it is a little earthy, you know, there's a little earthiness to that, which is really nice, but, you know, it, it works with just about any direction that you want. I like spicy uh, because with this, the, and, and you know, with the hatch chili uh, is at any heat, it basically neutralizes the heat. So you're able to, you know, really taste the uh, the real red peppers here without getting that hot burn you get the flavor and that's one of the advantages of this creamy buttery cheese thank you yeah. so we know you guys know this but we're from the beehive state thus beehive cheese we're from utah and we're a high mountain desert here i mean we're at five thousand feet 
Um, it's dry, super dry. And to age a cheese properly in a cave, you need 95% humidity. And um, it's probably 25% humidity outside of the house. So when we first started, we were open air aging some cheese. We did a cloth bound cheddar that was a really an amazing cheese. But we'd get these basically crevasses in the cheese, cracks, because it was too dry. And we fought it and we tried and we tried to humidify the, the cave. It, there was no, no having it. So you know what? Rather than fight it, beat them, you rejoin them. And so our rind ended up being a plastic um, vacuum sealed bag. And really the you know the purpose of the rind in addition to creating different flavors and whatnot, but for the most part, the rind protects the taste of the cheese from oxygen. And so our plastic bag protects the cheese from oxygen. And so we had to be creative because of the desert that we live in. And so when we first made Promontory, uh, it's a great cheese, but there are a lot of amazing white cheddars out there. And we wanted to do something a little bit more interesting and Tim, my brother-in-law, just had this stupid, crazy idea. You know, you put cream in coffee, why not put coffee on cream? And so <clears throat> away we went. The first two experiments that we did was our sea hive, which is our honey and salt rubbed cheese, and our barely buzzed, which is our coffee and lavender rubbed cheese. And so I'll talk a little bit about sea hive right now. So um, we've all heard about the Sundance Film Festival. There used to be a sea in the middle of Utah, in southern Utah, called the Sundance Sea. And that sea went extinct a long, long time ago. And when it did, it left this strata of salt. And there's a mine down there. It's called Redmond Real Salt. It's kind of got a pink hue to it. Amazing salt. We use the Redmond Real Salt and we use honey that is produced on our property um, just up the road, about six miles up the road, we have hives and we have bees and we have honey. And so we use our own honey. We use salt from Utah. We rubbed it on the cheese. And one of the things, again, going back to ACS, we have gotten, had the pleasure to get to know Mary Quick. And she's with Quick's Cheddar. She's been making cheese her whole life. Her family has for years and literally centuries. And we, she said, Pat, I love your cheeses because they're balanced. They're, after all, I'm going to the store to buy a piece of cheese. I'm not going to buy salt and honey. And so when we started putting things on the outside of cheese, we wanted it to be accent the cheese, but not over flavor the cheese. And so Sea Hive is a really good example of that, where taste side by side with promontory and Sea Hive you're gonna notice some big differences, but it's not in your face. You're not gonna get sweet. You're not gonna get salty. You're gonna get just a nice balance. Um, my brother, this is a goofy example, but my brother bought some really nice speakers one time. He sat me in a room, he made me close my eyes and he turned on some nice music. And the whole room was just enveloped with music and you couldn't even tell where the speakers were. Just the whole room filled with this beautiful sound and that's the way we want our cheese to be. We want it to be just flow out. We don't want it to just hit you in the face with salt or honey or anything. But Sea Hive is really an amazing cheese. I love Sea Hive. <clears throat> My very favorite pairing with Sea Hive is just a nice gala apple in the fall. I mean, it's it's amazing. But Sea Hive, so when you get a, a new camera or a new iPhone, whatever, um, those those little white um, silicon packets, they're desiccants. Those are to absorb the moisture in the, with the camera so it doesn't stay wet or get moist. Both honey and salt are desiccants. They're natural desiccants. And so sea hive becomes drier because a lot of the liquid is wicked out of the cheese by those two natural desiccants. So sea hive is a great cheese. It's really great with like Marcona almonds, great with figs. But my favorite, again, is with an apple in the fall. Michael, I want you to chime in here a little bit. Tell me about your experience with Sea Hive. With the Sea Hive, 
Uh, you know, there's 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 not that oh, golden retriever sticks her head in because she wants cheese. All right. She does. Yes, she does. All right. <laughs> so uh, uh, the saltiness isn't like when you when I imagine that you're using sea salt, that it's crusted sea salt and it's not. It has a, a little bit of uh, nice saltiness, but it's not overwhelming or anything like that. And the honey is very, very, like what you were saying is like, you hardly notice that. But what I did was uh, David Grimmels uh, sent me some uh, Willamette Valley uh, raw blackberry honey. And I slathered that on it. And, you know, it brings out a little bit more of the saltiness. And so you kind of get a little bit more uh, uh, of the, the flavors that kind of come out. I, I thought it was very nice. Tea hype was another experiment that we did. Um, it was kind of fun. We were actually had the opportunity to go to Portugal in the spring. And we were in Southern Portugal where there were, it was the most amazing thing because there were these beautiful citrus trees and they were on the sides of mountains. It wasn't like the flat orchard like we expect to see these these citrus trees, these orange trees were all over the mountainside. And the whole countryside smelled of orange blossoms. It was amazing. And my sweet wife said, let's make a cheese that tastes like this smells. And I told him, my partner, and I said, let's make an orange blossom cheese. And he laughed and he pulled out some Earl Grey tea, which has bergamot in it. And that's just a citrusy plant that they squish and they take, they, they extrude the oils out of it. And bergamot gave us that orange blossomy flavor. Tea hive is very interesting because it is almost like a palate cleanser. It's so clean and it's so um, floral and wonderful that when you're eating it, you're just, it's just, it's just a delight. And this one is amazing with bubbles. Just anything bubbles, whether it's just a San Peregrino or champagne, it's really great with bubbles. But with the tea hive, which the tea hive just by itself, you know, as, as when you think about a non, uh, uh, you know, alcoholic beverage, teas go very well, coffees go well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of flavors that you can get. Uh, that work well with cheese. And, and the tea is, is a beautiful match. It's, it's just a nice balance. So when you started talking about um, the orange blossom, I was thinking about how much I enjoy orange. So this is a uh, orange, uh, apricot orange spread that I have uh, with Bonnie's jams. Uh, and did some work with them on Tuesday and that, and uh, that's, it's a nice, orange is a, is a wonderful flavor as well for it. That is. You know, it's so interesting. You would expect for a blackberry blossom honey to be a dark honey, but when you think about blackberries, the blossoms are pure white. And so yeah. black, clear, blackberry blossoms and blackberry honey is very light and wonderful. Yeah. We have it a lot is. Of it's it's very very light, and it's uh you know it, it's one of those uh that you know I mean you know you're, you're, it's it it's not going to come out. It's it it's it's in here. It's thick. It's you know it's magnificent. You scrape it until you get the honey out, and like I said with the cheese, it just brings out more of that uh, you know that salt and uh, the, the honey comes out more. So it's, it's just a nice balance, you know. With these, you really don't have to add anything in it. And I think that's a nice part about it. I think, you know, just enjoying the cheese the way that you've done them is, is absolutely fabulous. But they lend themselves also well to be able to do things with them. So you have that option to be able to do that. So I, I was, we always laugh because Gordon Edgar, which we all know and love, and he's just a great guy, goofy guy, but 
when we first made, and this will introduce our Barely Buzz, when we first made Barely Buzz, um, Michael, you took it to the, the Today Show. If yes. you remember, this is a long time ago, and you wanted a quote, and one of the quotes we called Gordon Edgar up, said, Gordon, give us a quote about Barely Buzz, because he was a judge at ACS that year when we won first place with that cheese. And he says, it's about the only cheese I've ever had that has stuff on it that doesn't suck. <laughs> so, that was like, when we first started rubbing crazy stuff on cheese, people thought we were just these two yahoos from Utah that just didn't know what they can and can't do. And that's pretty much what it was. We didn't know what we couldn't do. When we told Utah State that we rubbed coffee on cheese, they kind of shook their head and they said, well, you can't do that. And we're like, well, come on down and tell us why. And they came down and they tasted it and they're like, well, um, um, and then they couldn't figure out a reason why, but they thought the acid in the cheap in the coffee would mess up all this stuff. But, you know, that's what put us where we are. We did stuff because we didn't know what we couldn't do. The example I love to tell, I've told it a hundred times, but, um, we were at the fancy food show, ran into a guy with a big Swiss cross on his main badge, and we got to chatting and talking. He was a Gruyere importer, but we, we, he asked me what we did, and I said, we make a coffee cheese, and we rub coffee on cheese. We're a small creamery from Utah, and he says, I know this cheese, and then he told me this story. He said, I was at a restaurant, um, Casa Lula in New York City. And out comes a cheese plate and Barely Buzzed is on this cheese plate. And he's there with his friend. And he just basically went into a tirade saying, these stinking Americans, they dig this, what are they doing with our cheese? And, and the guy basically said, shut up. It wouldn't be on the cheese plate if it wasn't good. Try it. Open your mind a little bit. So he tries it and he thinks and he says, these brilliant Americans are doing things with cheese that they would be hung for in their country because it, they just don't do that. And so if I can do something that makes the cheese even better, um, then why not? And so I, there's nothing better than a, just a nice extra virgin olive oil, for instance, I love olive oil. And then you add some citrus flavors and some people say, ah, I don't want that. I just want pure olive oil or I just want pure cheese. And I get that. But if we can do stuff that makes things more interesting. Um, when we first introduced it, we were just kind of like, what are they up to? And now um, we're respected and people love the cheese. And so it's good. Barely buzzed, um, Tim's brother, roasts the coffee down in Grand Junction, Colorado, about four, four hours from here. He sends us the beans whole. And in fact, right my, next to my office is our little uh, kitchen where we grind the coffee the morning that we're going to make it. And one thing that's unique about our cheeses is we'll make the cheese that comes out of the press. We put it on a table. We rub coffee and lavender on this cheese. We vacuum seal it down. And other than aging, the cheese is done. So because our cheese has so much fat and cream in it, we all know that those fats absorb flavors like crazy. And so the coffee lives for five or seven or eight or whatever months on that cheese as it ages and the flavors go all the way to the center. I always tell people when they first taste Barely Buzz to taste the cheese without the rind to start with. And you will, you will get the flavors have penetrated all the way to the middle of the wheel. And again, it won't just hit you in the face like, oh, but then it'll start to come through at the farmer's market when we first started introducing cheeses, you'd say it's got coffee and lavender on it and they just keep walking and then they kind of turn around and come back and say, you did what? And then I don't know if I'd like that. And like, well, there's a good way to find out. And then they would taste it. And the rind is wonderful. All of our cheeses are, the rinds are edible. And the coffee and lavender come out very wonderfully. 
Michael, you should have lots to say about Fairly Buzz. This is the cheese that definitely put us on the map. You know, uh, it's 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 one of those cheeses that, uh, for the longest time, was the ending of all of my cheese boards. You know, when I do a class and teach through there, I always have the barely buzzed on there because it was it's such a great way to wrap up because it's it could be a dessert in itself. It's kind of like at the end of a meal having a little cup of coffee and. And a little dessert and and having these together are are just phenomenal uh, and uh, I'm, I'm using it on monday for an event that i have with a special event and and uh, you know it's uh, a senior center and uh uh i thought it would really be really fun and everybody is just so anxious to you know to try that because they've never never even heard of it you know and so they're they're really excited about that class, but uh, pairing wise, you know, there's just so much that you can do with this because the the coffee does lend itself. It's not a uh, an overpowering, but it is it does penetrate through uh, the rind brings it up, but it doesn't give you like you're sucking on a uh, a, a bean. Uh, it really does uh, add some nice flavor. Um, I'm pairing it up with a fat toad uh, goat caramel, uh, and this is a spicy um, um, dark chocolate. Oh, making me jealous. Dark chocolate, and, and this is absolutely fabulous. You know, the coffee, the chocolate there, you know, uh, and uh, it's just, this brings out so many things. It, it, it just works easily together so you know you can do a lot with that make that a dessert and also uh, i have a raspberry uh, spread that the chocolate the raspberry and this cheese with the coffee would be just crazy good too and i love it with um rustic bakery's cocoa nib chocolate cookies i mean i love i love it with that as well it's really good yes i have yeah. some some uh, Effie's cocoa, uh, which has got coconut in it, and it's uh, uh, malt, uh, you know, in it. And so that's, it, it works out just drizzling the chocolate on that with the cheese and the coffee. And it's just fabulous. Just it's awesome. Yeah. And, it, and again, uh, like on all those, as I said before, you don't have to, you don't have to have anything additional to it. It lives and breathes and works very well on its own, but it is so nice to, you know, uh, dress it up occasionally. So I know you're a big beer connoisseur, Michael, but a brown beer, I mean, with the Barely Buzzed is awesome. Really great. The malts uh, in beer uh, and dark beers like that work out really well. A chocolate stout, a oatmeal stout works very well. An imperial stout does, you know, beautifully. But you know, there's uh, uh, red ales that do really well because of that maltiness that uh, that associates with it. So you know, you can do that. Um, you know, Blue Moon does an iced coffee uh, beer, and uh, uh, I actually have it. Uh, but I uh, and uh, I have tried it with uh, other things that that works really well. But it would it would work as well. It's good. When we first started, I took a trip down the west coast of um, California just to go visit some wineries. And it was hilarious because I visited about 20 wineries. And of the 20, I think 15 of them had our cheese already. I'm like, well, why did I even come? But our barely buzz with like, like a medium Pinot, a Pinot Noir is just insane. So coffee with the cheese and the, the wine is, is super good. So. Kind of fun. Yeah, I ran into Tim uh, uh, about maybe four years ago. I was teaching at the uh, California Artists and Cheese Festival, and you guys were there. And he brought his little camper and and all that. And we sat around, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the show, enjoying some cheeses and introducing it to some of the people that work there. People that work at festivals never get a chance to enjoy cheese. 
because right. they're working. So, mm -hmm. you know, having an opportunity to tell everybody is, come on over here and sit down and enjoy is, is, is really nice. That's fun. Another thing about Barely Buzz that's interesting is it is my go-to um, grilled cheese sandwich cheese. It makes no sense at all, but it's of all of our cheeses that I have, I love the Barely Buzz. Red Butte Hatch Chili is a close second, but I do mine out of Barely Buzz. I love that cheese. So, okay, so last cheese, um, pour me a slice. It is our Basil Hayden bourbon washed cheese. I got a call from John Antonelli about three years ago. And he said, I've got a Basil Hayden bourbon sales rep in my office and they want to make, they want to do a che or cheese and bourbon pairing. And we said, well, why don't we wash the cheese with the bourbon? And we did. Um, we formed a beautiful partnership with uh, Basil Hayden, Beam Sun Pori. And we rolled this cheese out in New York on Halloween a year and a half ago. And it was so fun because the next day we're in Forbes magazine talking about this crazy pairing of cheese and bourbon. But wow, what an amazing cheese. That, I guess, is the word that we have. If we don't say wow when we taste a cheese, a new experiment, like Michael said at the beginning, it's not easy to come up with a brand new cheese. But if we all say wow and we're clamoring to get more of the, of the cheese, we know we have a success. And the Basil Hayden was a match made in heaven from the get-go. As soon as we had it, um, I think the sweetness of the corn and the cheese is just, it's amazing. But this cheese is very subtle. It is not going to burn your mouth with whiskey. It takes a minute to develop, but the finish on this cheese is, is amazing. But there are a lot of, sorry, that's really good. There are a lot of people out there that are moving away from wine and beer. They still are drinking wine and beer as well, but cocktails and bourbons and basil Hayden is just a real introductory, middle of the road, beautiful bourbon. And we love this cheese. It's just really a great cheese. Michael, you put me on a bourbon panel in Kentucky a while back, and it was hilarious because I don't drink bourbon, but <laughs> you're a bourbon connoisseur. Tell us about this cheese. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I had a, uh, uh, a four series show with uh, Adam Harris. He's the senior ambassador for Basil Hayden. And so we sat down and of course we did your cheeses first. Uh, um, and uh, so we covered that and then we did Marike and a couple others. And it's, and Basil doesn't just have one, they have an entire line. They have tenure, they have a, a dark rye, they have a Caribbean style with some molasses in it. So there's a lot of things they do. It's 80 proof, which uh, is actually uh, for bourbon, Pretty lightweight, you know. Um, you know, you get into 109 on the Knob Creek, where you know that that sets you back a little bit. Um, but it's just a great sipping. But also with with cheese, it's fabulous. So um, I've been enjoying bourbon and and cheese for a long time. IDDBA, I did a bourbon class, uh, and uh, uh, next, not I think it's the 20. Fifth or 26th, I'm having Adam back on, and uh, we're doing cheese charcuterie and bourbon. So that's uh, fun. <laughs> but uh, you know, amplifying it, uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, you know, being up and uh, getting up to Vermont and getting out with uh, the Fat Toad people, uh, they're they're wonderful. And this is a uh, uh, it's a uh, salted bourbon caramel. And, you know, you don't really taste a lot of the, the bourbon bourbon, uh, you know, but it, again, what the uh, other things did with the cheese is X in it. So you have a little bit of bourbon, the, the flavor on the cheese. So you add a little bit here and it steps it up again. So you really get a nice amplification and it works really well. But, you know, just sitting down to a, a, a bourbon neat 
and the cheese it works just just perfectly and as a matter of fact uh that that sounds really good when i get done here i pour me a nice uh nice neat bourbon and uh i'll uh start finishing our work tonight <laughs> there you go we did a thing just before christmas that was talking about how to um continue to host a party during COVID times. And it was really crazy because they put up a big green screen behind us and then they had this table. And I was actually speaking with Adam on one side and I was in another, he was in New York, I'm in Utah. And it looked like we were at the same table together. But I tell you, that was, it was nerve wracking because if you look left, you had to look right and it was all backwards. But we had a pretty fun conversation, but man, fun cakes with bourbon and um, just, you know, all these amazing foods, that fat toad stuff is just like, it's just creamy and delicious. It's amazing. So it's so cool. I, I've always said the fact that you're local is not a rite of passage into a nice restaurant, for instance, or a retail establishment as well. If we can make cheeses that are comparable or better than our European or world, the rest of the world, then heck yes, put our cheese on your menu and enjoy it. But if it's not as good, then shame on us. We've got work to do. And that's the cool thing about our industry. I mean, really, the artisan cheese movement in, in the U.S. is really 15 to 20 years old. And then, you know, like you mentioned with David winning the best of in the world, the, you know, blue cheese last year. Um, it's amazing. We as Americans are making amazing cheeses and um, we're earning our right at the table. So it's pretty fun that way. 